Hello everybody, this is David here from ELT Sandbox and this video is a quick guide to the history of digital game-based language learning. Uh, this is something uh, I researched last year. Um, originally I wrote an article about this for the Young Learner and Teenager SIG, uh, part of IATEFL for their 30th anniversary uh, magazine newsletter. Um, you can find details of that article in the video description. Um, now, I did think at first, is there 30 years of game-based language learning? And I was surprised to find there was. But first of all, what do I mean by game-based learning? Well, I'm talking here about bringing uh, games that are available for general sale, bringing them into a learning environment and using them with language learners. I'm not talking about gamification, completely different. I'm not talking about educational games, which I'm not a fan of, but that's something for another video, another time. So. 1980s. This is a time we're getting computers available in people's homes for the first time. We're getting gaming consoles. Also computers coming into schools. Things like the BBC Micro, if you were a student in the UK, you'll be familiar with that. One genre of game which was of interest to educators and uh, language educators uh, was the text-based adventure. So you see an example here from a game called Pirate Cove. Um, you read a couple of paragraphs and then you get a question like this, what shall I do now? And you type in a command. So a guy called Rolf Palmberg investigated Pirate Cove with um, some Swedish primary school children, elementary language, uh, elementary English learners. And um, he played, had them play two 45-minute sessions, spaced a month apart. And then another month after that, he gave them a vocabulary test based on some words and phrases that came up into the game. And they aced it. Um, so basically, the game, despite not much playtime and despite their low level of English, the game, the context of the game, seeing that language used, interacting with it, uh, seeing it in the context of the pirate story, uh, it really helped them retain the vocabulary. But of course, these games had their limits. I remember playing them myself, getting frustrated because I'd type in a command and the computer wouldn't respond. You'd have to come up with something very specific. I mean, the sophistication of computers to understand language input wasn't really there. But moving into the 90s, we start to see developments in technology. CD-ROMs appear on home computers and school computers. So this allows the use of full motion video, or FMV. So these started to be incorporated into games um, as a way to, to have more spoken, authentic language in. So obviously, this was of interest to language learners again. There's an article, I'll reference this in the description, by Warshaw and Healy, and they look into these FMV games and how uh, it can offer that authentic spoken language um, and better listening practice. Of course, they say in terms of the students producing something, we would need uh, more sophisticated technology for that to have them understand spoken output. But also in the 1990s in the gaming world, and also referenced in the same article, games like Myst, where you're starting to get these 3D worlds, so these much more immersive uh, experiences, gaming experiences coming up, um, which would uh, it's allowed the student to move around in the world, to or the player, sorry, then to interact with objects. So for students, this this is a much more involving experience and something that maybe gets them thinking and gets them wanting to describe things and talk about their gaming experiences. Then moving into the 2000s, the internet comes along. So this is very important for a number of reasons. First of all, forums. We get players of games from around the world coming together on forums, exchanging ideas, guides, asking for advice. And this is all going on through the medium of English. So it's a great way for authentic communication to develop. Also, virtual worlds like Second Life start appearing. If you were involved in EdTech about 10 years ago, this was a very big thing back then. It's still going on now, although not quite as popular, maybe not quite reached the heights that were expected. But we saw here this offered a chance for uh, for distance learners uh, to come together uh, within the say, share, say, excuse me, same shared virtual space and interact with each other. And a lot of educational institutions invested a lot of time and money into developing things in, in Second Life. Now, some people argue that this wasn't really a game. That's not a debate we need to go into now. But in terms of online experiences for gamers, we had MMOs, massively multiplayer online experiences coming. So you see here some of the most popular examples. So in these games, players come together, they're online synchronously, and they have to collaborate 
uh, and work together to complete a lot of the quests. So uh, Warcraft in particular is one that's uh, garnered a lot of attention. And uh, if we look, there's a 2012 special edition of Recal. Again, uh, I'll put this in the video description. Um, and some researchers investigated the use of Warcraft for second language learners. These were Spanish language learners. Um, and I'm quoting from the article here. They concluded that the unique context for language learning and socialization um, it's a marked contrast to the insulated communicative environments of many language classrooms. Um, so they're talking here about, the, the, again, the authentic experience, the real purpose for using language. Now, of course, there are limits here that the interaction level can be quite high paced. Uh, if you're interacting with non-language learners, they're not ex necessarily going to have patience while you struggle to formulate your sentence. Um, Cost also. I mean, Warcraft requires a monthly subscription. The game itself is quite expensive. It demands quite a high-spec computer to run on, which not a lot of schools can offer, not everybody can have in their homes. But coming forward to now, into this 2010s decade, which we're nearing the end of, but um, I think this is a very exciting time for digital game-based learning and digital game-based language learning, because a lot of those barriers that I've talked about are kind of coming down. Cost. Uh, some of the games you can see here, we can see Can You Escape? It's a free app to download to your tablet. Fallen London, web-based browser game, completely free. The other games are indie games, and they're available quite cheaply, just a few pounds, a few euros, a few dollars from places like Steam or Humble Bundle. Um, so that accessibility um, is not the issue that it once was. Also, these can run on quite low-spec machines. They might even work on some of our cranky old school computers. Um, also, sophistication. The games, the software is much more sophisticated these days, so it's uh, able to, you know, calculate and compute a lot more input from the player, which uh, creates a much more realistic experience, a much more personalised experience, which is also great for learning. Um, if we take as a as an example here, her story. This is the FMV game coming back with a vengeance. Here we have video clips of a woman. The different police interviews We've got these different fragments of clips you have to search through the clips and try to piece together this murder mystery and the great thing is you know you have to listen intently pick out clues and find new thing new search terms to put into the database um, so you could have two groups of students playing on different machines and they would work their way through the clips in a completely different order um, and then it's a great way for discussion to come up discussion at the machine if you get players playing together about what to do next and what they understood from the most recent clip and what what they want to search for next. Also, between the groups, getting them to take breaks in play and come together and discuss what they were talking about. Um, another one here, Undertale. This is like a, a resurgence for the text-based adventure, interactive fiction. Um, it's a big thing these days in gaming. So you have these games where the choices the player make have far-reaching consequences and completely alter the way the game plays out. So in Undertale, uh, one of the most basic choices you have to make is does your character fight or does your character try to talk its way out of trouble? And obviously this greatly affects the, the way the game plays out. Um, so again, just these different experiences within the same game, it's great for discussion between the players. Um, there's a lot of text for them to read and understand in this game as well and uh, to come across vocabulary. I mean, in general, I mean, we, even games without language in them, like Can You Escape, uh, it's a great thing to bring into class for, you know, talking about rooms, describing rooms, using prepositions of place, using those furniture vocabulary things. Build, getting stu I get my students to build their own guides to each level, which you know is a great way to get them producing language as well. So like I said, it's a really exciting time, I think, for digital game-based learning now. Games are much more accessible. They're much better. So this is, uh, this is what I'm excited about. So as we go into this new year, I hope you'll be joining me, uh, ELT Sandbox. So please like the video, subscribe to the channel, share the video through your social media. Likewise, for the blog, uh, go to the Facebook page. Follow me on Twitter. I'm David. Thanks for watching. The game has just begun. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.